perhaps you have seen the anecdotal uh, the clock with the sign above it that says this clock is defective don't blame the hands mm -hmm. the problem is much deeper this anecdotal saying points us to genesis chapter 34 since the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, Genesis 34 is one of those chapters where we come away scratching our heads and thinking, why on earth would the Holy Spirit inspire this chapter to be in the Bible? What are we supposed to learn from Genesis 34? Since we know that the Holy Spirit moved human authors so that scripture is not without the influence of the human authors, the question is, what did Moses have in mind when he chose to record the incidents we have here in Genesis chapter 34? Now, just as a brief recap, I'll just mention in chapter 33, when we were in chapter 33 two weeks ago, Jacob and Esau finally meet and are reconciled. In verse 12, Esau says, let's, let's take our journey, let's go home. But Jacob declines and he stays behind. Jacob is in no hurry to get home. Jacob is going to take the long, slow way home. And he's going to learn a lot of lessons on his way home. He goes to Succoth in verse 17, where he lives there for a while because he builds a house there. Then in 18 and 19 of chapter 33, Jacob finally returns to the valley, to Canaanite Valley. But he doesn't go to Mamre and Beersheba, where his parents are. He first settles on the outskirts of the city in a place called Shechem. Shechem. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong about him living in Shechem because that's the place where Abraham came way back when, when he first came from Haran to Canaan. He stopped in Shechem. The only problem is that Jacob is home, but he's not really home. He comes back to Canaan, but he doesn't go to Mamre. It's kind of like saying, the person came back to the United States. Well, we're in the United States. It's a big place. But he's down in Shechem, and he decides to live there in the Shechem Valley for a while. And the only thing that we need to remember is that our decisions have consequences. And Shechem is ruled by a chiefsman uh, by the name of Hamor. Hamor has a son, he's the prince, and they name him Shechem. And this is how we get to Genesis 34, Genesis chapter 34. Jacob has a daughter named Dinah, born to him by Leah. Dinah goes out to see the daughters of the land. Why? Because we all need relationships. She needs female friendship. She's a girl. She grows up in a home with 11 brothers. Can you imagine that? And so in verse 2, it says that when she went down there, that when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. He sexually assaulted her. Jacob finds out about it. Hamor comes down to Jacob's place to talk with him because Shechem now has the girl in his house and Shechem says to his father, you need to go down and find a way to, to let her dad let me marry her. And so while Hamor is down at Jacob's place, the boys come home, Jacob's sons come home from a long day's work at the field and let's just say that they are ticked off by what they find out, to put it mildly. They don't like what's going on. And they said, 
They said, you know, this is wrong. This is wrong. Verse 13, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had, he had defiled Dinah, their sister. These boys, Jacob's sons, had evil intent in their heart for the men of Shechem. And they're going to do what they're going to do because in their minds, the end justifies the means. Here's how they're thinking. Shechem has raped our sister. We need to avenge her. And the way we do that is to kill him. But if we kill him, the men of the city will rise up and kill us. After all, we're just a family and they're a whole city. So what do we have to do? We need to kill all the men in this town, not just Shechem. How do we kill all of them? Well, it's just a few of us. So the thing we need to do is to find a way to make them defenseless. And they concocted to tell these guys, look, we circumcise ourselves. You guys don't. So, you know, Hamor had said, you take our daughters, we'll take your sons. If we're going to have this intermarriage thing, then every male in the city of Shechem needs to get circumcised. It was a plot. So that when they were sore and painful and defenseless, they could kill them. They said this to Hamor. Hamor goes and tells the men of the city. They gladly agree. And on the third day after, they say that three days into the circumcision process is when it's most painful. On the third day, Simeon and Levi took their swords and they went through the city and they slaughtered, they massacred all the men of Shechem, men and boys, young and old. This is bad. This is gruesome. Mm -hmm. Why is this even in the Bible? <laughs> Verses 30 and 31, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have, you have made me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Since we are few in number, they will gather themselves together against me, and they will kill me, and I will be destroyed in my household. And listen to what the boys say to their father. See, Jacob's concern is not about the wrong that was done to Dinah. It's about his, his security. And the boys say, Daddy, listen. <laughs> Should this thing have been done, should Shechem be allowed to treat our sister that way? So there's rape, as they call it. There's deception. There's mass murder. And what do we learn from this? Very quickly, since we're running out of time here, I'll just tell you that what we have here in Genesis 34 the lesson here is a lesson on morality, morality. Morality is about right and wrong. To be a moral person is to be a person of uprightness. To be immoral is to do the opposite. So morality is about rightness and wrongness. What we have here in Genesis 34 is a picture of life in a lawless society. Back up to verse 7. It says, And the sons of Jacob came in from the field. <clears throat> when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a, dis a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. Listen to the last line. A thing which ought not to have been done. For Jacob's son, this was an issue of morality. It should not have been done. This is a moral issue for these boys. And the question is, where did they get their morality from? 
Remember, they're about to become a nation. Each of these boys will become the head of a tribe in the nation of Israel. When God brings this nation out of Egypt, the first thing that he's going to do after they do the Passover is to give them the law, the law of Moses. God gave them the law not to control them. This is something that we need to get in our heads. God didn't give them the law as a bad thing to control them, as some Christians look at the law today. God gave them the law to bless them. This is God gave them the law to help them to live right, how to treat one another right, how to relate to one another, how to relate to the, to the world around them in order that they might secure their freedom and their fruitfulness and their joy as a new nation. That's why they got the law. And the moral law addresses, believe it or not, in Genesis, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the moral law addresses what happens when a young man violates a young woman. When a young man sexually violates a female, the law addresses this. It's amazing what we have here. What I think Moses wants us to get here is that long before the law was given by Moses, in the hearts of these young men, the law existed. Isn't this what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, Romans 1 and 2? That them not having the law written and encoded before them have the law of God written in their hearts. That's why no man is without excuse. No man has a valid excuse. Of course, we should note very carefully that while these boys are getting it right with this moral law about what was done to their sister, they're getting it wrong about how they respond to the situation. Because you see, the law of Moses addresses this very issue, that the punishment must match the crime. In, 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 in Mosaic law, this is called the lex talionis. This is the Latin term, lex talionis, T-A-L-I-O-N-I-S, the law of retaliation. And Lex Talionis says that the punishment cannot be greater than the crime committed. Exodus 21, verses 25 through 27, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Some people read that and think that God is saying, if somebody plucks out your eye, you ought to go pluck their eye out. No, that's not what it's saying. This law is to govern how you respond if somebody plucks out your eye. You can't kill a person for plucking out your eye. You can only pluck out their eye. This is the law of retaliation. And what these boys are missing is that you can't kill all the men in the city because one man raped your sister. That's why they needed the law. Every country on earth makes laws. And that's why God gave Israel the moral law. The law has its place. Romans chapter 6. The problem with the law is not the law. The problem with the law is the people who are trying to keep the law. That's why Paul says in Galatians that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law is supposed to show you that you can't keep it. I can't do this. I keep failing my finals. I keep getting my tests wrong. I need a private tutor. And the law is the pedagogy that brings us to the, to the schoolmaster, to the private tutor. And guess who the private tutor is? The private tutor is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, I go there all the time. Forgive me for going there again. 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says, every time they repeat the law, there's a veil over their face. But Paul says that the veil is taken away in Christ, and we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being changed. Why? Because we become what we're gazing at. And as we gaze at him, we're being transformed from one level of glory to the next. Nothing, 
Nothing in the law can do that for you. You see, the people in the Old Testament didn't have Jesus. We do. They didn't have the Holy Spirit living in their lives. We do. They needed a moral law. And the world needs a moral law. But thank God we have Jesus. And Genesis 34 stands as a chilling reminder of what can happen in a lawless society. And that's how we get to chapter 35. Jacob gets closer and closer home. Then God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled before the face of your brother Esau. Arise, go to Bethel, stay there and build an altar. Four specific imperatives God gives to Jacob. Go back to Bethel, to the place where you first met me. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first believed you. In verse 6, Jacob arrives at Bethel. In verse 7, Jacob renames Bethel because God appears to him again. God reiterates the promise. God reminds him that he has a new name. Your name is Israel, no longer Jacob. And in that wonderful experience, Jacob renames the place El Bethel. In his first encounter with God in this place, he called it Bethel, the house of God. Surely, truly God is in this place, and I didn't know it. But now the second time, he names it El Bethel. Let me, let me help you here, though some of you are way ahead of me. Beth, Beth, Bethlehem. Beth means house. El is the word for God, the common name for God. So Bethel is house of God. But he renames it El Bethel. What he's saying is, this is the God of the house of God. A lot of us love God's, we love God's house. But do you love the God of the house of God? Do you love the God of the house of God? Verse 8. Verse 8, Deborah dies. This is a chilling reality, a harsh reality, a lesson on death. Jacob is learning all kinds of lessons. One of them is that death is with us all the time. Deborah dies. We all, we're all going to die someday. And because we're all going to die someday, the question is, how shall we then live today? Notice there are four burials in chapter 35. Four burials in chapter 35. In verse 8, Deborah dies. Rachel's maid dies. In verses 16 through 20, Rachel dies. She dies while giving, while giving birth to Benjamin. She dies in childbirth. And she was buried on the way by Ephrathah, by Bethlehem, which is very interesting. The prophet speaks of this, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Rachel weeping for her children, and they're not. This is, you know, so much here to unpack. So Deborah dies, Rachel dies, Esau dies. At the end of the chapter, Esau dies and is buried. But notice what else dies. Or notice what else is buried in this chapter. Verses 2 through 4, Jacob turns to his family and says, I want you to take off all the idols and the earrings and the, 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 the false gods that you took from back in Paid and Aaron, bring them to me. And they brought them to him. And he dug a hole beneath the tamarisk tree and he buried all the idols. What's going on here? Jacob is learning. Jacob is learning. There is a morality going on in Jacob's mind. Jacob knows in his heart that idolatry is wrong. By the way, that is the first thing that God addresses in the Decalogue. I am the God who brought me out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. 
And Jacob, way before the Decalogue, way before Moses, Jacob knows this. And so he buries these idols. More than the fact that he has this morality thing going on is the fact that Jacob, this is an indication of Jacob's heart. Jacob has this inclination toward devotion. Jacob understands that a faithful God, the God who has been so faithful to him, deserves his full devotion. And the full devotion of all those who are with him. And he's not going to sit around and allow them to, to, to worship these false gods and these idols and so he commands them to bring them to him, and he buries them. And that's the fourth burial that takes place in this chapter. In verses 21 and 22, Reuben sleeps with Bila, Jacob's concubine. Another, another big thing here in the chapter that just makes you shake your head, you know. I guess if Jacob had gone to an AA meeting, he would say, I think when it became his turn, my name is Jacob and I come from a broken family, very broken family. Life is messy. And most families are messy families, messed up families. And so what, we, what we're noticing is that when we look at what Reuben did, when Reuben went and became involved in this incestuous relationship with Billa. What strikes me and what should strike all of us is that this family, this, this messed up family, that this is the raw material out of which God is going to build a nation for himself. Not because they're special, but because God loves them. And plans to redeem them. Verse 27, Jacob finally arrives back at home. Jacob picks up, stops at several places, and he finally, this last time, he comes to Mamre where Isaac lives. And the Bible says that he reunites with his father, and his father dies, and Jacob and Esau, they bury their father. Question, where is Rebecca, Jacob's mom? Who does Jacob most want to meet when he gets back home? Mama, the one who had taken to him, who had loved him more and, and, and coaxed him and, and led him. He wants to see mom, but there is no mention here of Rebecca. You know, one could say that Rebecca was there. The Bible just doesn't mention her name. The Bible is giving you the big pieces, not the details. In fact, it makes it sound like Jacob got home and Esau immediately dies. That's far from the truth. Esau lives for many years. He lives to be 180 years old, but he's blind from a young age, has visual issues. It is believed that Esau, or rather Isaac, lived to see his grandkids grow up and lived to meet Joseph and, and, and Benjamin. And so it is quite possible, quite probable that Rebecca was there. But preacher's imagination and like I like to see this passage, it is surmised that when Jacob got back home, Rebecca had already passed. And for me as a preacher, this is fodder from Mother's Day material. Years ago, I preached a sermon called, Things I Would Tell My Mother If I Could. Things I would tell my mother if I could. Things Jacob would say to Rebecca if he could, if she was still living. Lessons that Jacob has learned on the journey home. Let me give you three, a couple quick lessons, things that I believe Jacob 
would have said to Rebecca, or perhaps he did, who knows? We don't know for sure, but from the posture of, you know, thinking that she's not there, I allow the preacher here now, preacher's license, Rebecca is dead. Here are the things that, that Jacob would say to Rebecca if he could. Number one, mom, God satisfies hungry hearts. God satisfies hungry hearts. In Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits toward me. Who redeems your life from destruction and who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Jacob would tell his mom how he has learned that God satisfies the hungry heart. Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. By his blood I now am saved. Well of water, ever springing, bread of life so full and free, untold wealth that never faileth. My Redeemer is to me. God satisfies the loving, the, the hungry heart. Lesson number two, I think Jacob would say, Mom, God repairs broken relationships. I know it for a fact. When I left home, my brother Esau said he was going to kill me. That's why you sent me away. Guess what? Along the way home, Esau and I are reconciled. We were reconciled. And brothers and sisters, the story of reconciliation is a story of redemption. God restoring broken relationships is a story of God and us. God, God repairs broken relationships. Number three, God's goal for all of us is that our faith would come to fully rest. In him. I believe that Jacob, maybe with tears in his eyes, would explain to his mom what he has learned. And that is that God's goal for every single one of his children. And this point, by the way, is a point that I made very forcibly when we had the farewell to Abraham. Abraham's faith came to fully rest in God. And now Jacob is experiencing the same thing. Jacob, the supplanter, the guy who strove with everyone around him, the guy who wrestled with God, the guy who was always striving and jostling and trying to get more. Now he comes home to tell mom, mom, guess what I learned? God's goal is to bring us to a place where our faith fully rests in him. Mom, at long last, I've come to figure out that the dynamic, the key to a dynamic relationship with God is not figuring out how we could love God more, or do more, or read our Bible more. All these things are important. But the real issue is to understand how much he loves us. Because love so amazing, so divine, demands my life and my soul and my all. Jacob would look at his mom and say, Mom, guess what I learned? Mom, I learned God loves us with a love that will not let us go. We mess up. We make mistakes. We fail him. We hurt his heart. But his love never lets us go. This reminds me of the beautiful hymn story. The story of George Matheson. George Matheson grew up in Glasgow, Scotland. He's the author of that beautiful song, Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. It's in our hymn book. It's a beautiful song. In fact, we, I thought to ask Sister Bob come to sing the song today, as I've heard her sing it in the past. 
Oh, love that will not let me go. Jordan Matheson, by the time he turned 18, developed an eye disease that would eventually render him blind. He was engaged to be married and his fiance, when his eye problem became worse, came to him a day before the wedding and said, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I don't think I can marry a blind man. The responsibilities, the burden, too much. And he struggled with that. And his sister came into his life and loved him and studied Hebrew and Greek and Latin and helped him. He became a prolific writer and a, and, a, and a pastor with the help of his sister. But then one day, his sister was swept off her feet by a guy who fell in love with her, and she told him how much she loved him, but she had to let him go because she had to take this opportunity. And it was in that moment that God, in his grief, that God gave him the song. In fact, Matheson says that it was one of the most easiest things for him to write. He says he believes he wrote this song in five minutes. The God who loves us with a love that will not let us go. Listen to the lyrics. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Verse 2 says, O light that followest all my way. Do you realize there's a light that follows you? And that that light is the light of Jesus. John says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. I my heart restores its borrowed ray, that in thy sunshine blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. Matheson goes from love to light, and then he goes to joy. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I dare not Hide my heart from thee. You know, when we get hurt, well, we, what do we do? We hide our heart because we don't want to be hurt anymore. Oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I dare not hide my heart from thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and find the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. Now he goes to the cross. From love to light to joy, and by God's grace, all of us, we end up at the cross of Jesus Christ. He comes to the cross, and Matheson writes in the final verse of this beautiful hymn, O cross that liftest up my head. We have to lift our head to see the cross, to see Jesus on the cross, to lift our head above the strife, above the battle, above COVID, above the deafness and the dying all around us. Oh, oh cross that liftest up my head. I dare not ask to fly from thee. I, I lay in dust life's glory dead. And from the ground there blossoms red. Life that shall endless be. Endless be. You know, we're talking about things that we would tell our mother if we could. And by my assumption, Jacob couldn't tell his mother because she wasn't there anymore. And now I'm saying to you, is your mother still there? Have you told her the things that God is teaching you? Have you told mom you love her? Because you see, brothers and sisters, mom, mama, mother, whatever you call your mom, God's plan, God has a plan 
to bring all of us to the end of striving like he brought Jacob so that we can discover him to be our all in all, above all else, above all else. And so he wants to grow us up, he wants to grow us up. I end today with these words from Sarah Teasdale about growing up. It's called wisdom. Listen to these words. When I have ceased to break my wings against the faultiness of things and learn that compromises wait behind each hardly opened gate, when I have looked life in the eye and grown calm and very coldly wise, life will have given me the truth and taken in exchange my youth. That's what happened to Jacob. He met life. And life gave him the truth and took in exchange Jacob's youth, that striving, supplanting Jacob, and turned him into the father of Israel. And oh, may God do that for you. May God do that for me in our own context. And like the songwriter says, he who has brought me hither too will help me all my journey through and give me daily cause to raise new Ebenezer is to his praise. Amen. Amen.